I'm Fiona Wall, Navasa Wall. I am a mother of three. I am a wife and a daughter and a Christian. As a young child, should I say, be before I was 10 years old, I was very impetuous, I was very aggressive. I was a tomboy. <laughs> People don't believe that, but I was. Actually, before I turned five, I was quite short and fat and, and, and very stubborn. And I had a fierce temper. My dad sometimes used to call me Hitler. Um, but the one thing I had was words. <laughs> I think I was speaking in the womb. I was just always chatty and uh, teaching people. So even in nursery school, even in, I was always the one learning big words and trying to teach people. When we'd go to the village, I'd gather all my little cousins and try to teach them. And um, I was, I loved music and movies. I was very impressionable. So my parents used to say that I lived in the movies because <laughs> I was always, you know, um, we had one television station and there was one movie they showed every Christmas and it was Sound of Music. So I felt, like a kindred spirit with Maria because, you know, my mom used to say, who can solve a problem like me? <laughs> so um, I was born with two brothers. So naturally I gravitated towards boys. So growing up, I didn't want to be a girl. I did everything to be a boy. The maids used to have a party. They would say, sit in a basket, you'll wake up tomorrow and you're a boy. So I did all sorts of things to turn into a boy. Oh, and I had an incurable temper, like it was, I couldn't control myself when I was angry and my words and, and, and everything. That's why I was called Hitler. <laughs> Even my parents were scared of my temper then. But that day when I gave my life to Christ, I don't know what happened to the temper. It disappeared completely. And then I got hooked onto books. Before that, I was the one climbing the coconut trees up to the top with a rope. The beauty for me about being a woman, and I'm not going to say in this century at all, is that you are the life giver. You are the back, you're the back door. So when it comes to laws, we have one of the best constitutions in the world. I mean, it ensures us a 30% place in parliament by ensuring that every constituency has a woman's vote, a woman's seat. Uh, unfortunately, in the interpretation of that, women only run for that seat. They don't also campaign for the others. But um, we also have women owning property. Property rights are protected. Chapter 4 of the Constitution is amazing in as far as uh, access to justice and all these other things. But there, there are things in our society that have crept up that I feel that the law is not looking into. One of those things, and, and even our succession laws, everything now really is good for the woman. But uh, I mean, look at what uh, the policies even that have been put in place, the 1.5 points, the, the UPE, that two of them should be affirmative action. When after the Beijing conference, I think you, the Ghanaian women who went to the Beijing conference really, really set us on the right path. But in COVID, we had about 35,000 kids in Wakiso turning up pregnant under the age of 15 girls. Uh, this was serious defilement. Just before COVID, we had Parliament do a study on sexual harassment in schools. The results were very damning. It's called, it was called the Rakojo Commission. And this was following the scandal at the St. Lawrence schools. I don't know whether you saw those when... when you know that the proprietor passed away and the number of pregnancies teenage pregnancies that turned out so after this report comes out and it, it informs a sexual offenses bill that is supposed to uh, have things like registering of offenders that's something that exists in europe and america and i think it's a very good thing i think if you are a convicted sexual offender you should be registered because our schools are full of headmasters and, and teachers who move from one school to the other, defiling children and getting away with it because there is no proper record of who these offenders are. These offenders have no business being around children. There's a very weak implementation, um, should I say, mechanism. We're talking about their laws against domestic violence, but we don't have shelters for women who are suffering domestic violence. The Ministry of Gender has tried, but they're very few. 
we're talking about children and women's rights and all these things but we have probation officers who are overworked scattered no budget so we have a law but the implementation mechanism and the budgets that are allocated to these areas are very you know the, the courts of law are supposed to be the place where these laws are where you get justice and right now i think the budget for the judiciary is about now which is a whole arm of government is about maybe four four percent i think the first challenge to anybody any ugandan on access to justice is access to information do they know where to go do they know what has just happened to them is a crime that they can report to the police do they know what can happen even the ones that are committing the crime don't know that it's a crime but also i'm going to bring on something else when you talk about access to justice there are a lot of children in the system there are a lot of children that on average in 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 the prisons i'll tell you some statistics we had in 2022 we had about 65000 prisoners in the whole country of these 35000 were on remand and of those 35000 about 20000 had been on remand for such a long time that if they had been sentenced they had even surpassed the sentences so they've never had their day in court so these people have no access to justice whether they are men, women, or children, we have a lot of knowledge gaps. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad Nalo is doing this. I hope that you translate some of these things. Mm -hmm. We have um, an issue of budget priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we focus a lot on the central government and what it can do. And I think also we have facilitated a lot of rot in our institutions. The last thing I'll say is we have not been a allowing our institutions to work. We, we are making, what, there's something they say these days, a person to hold up. Institutions seem to revolve around individuals and the individuals who run them. We need to measure, so we need to measure the efficiency of institutions. We need to recruit people who, we have, we have government officials and and people that have that have um, how can I say it? Institutions have become about whoever is leading them, not about the people they are supposed to serve. So we need to change. Uh, we need to emphasize service delivery. We need to em emphasize public accountability. We need to emphasize transparency. But actually, I think transparency we are scoring because now we know what even parliamentarians are using in their bedrooms, you know. But what is that serving us if nothing is done? We have a very non-responsive government when it comes to issues of corruption. And that is, um, that is going to be our biggest. We are losing eight trillion annually, apparently from some reports, to corruption. As a country, we cannot afford that. We cannot afford it because this is money that is supposed to be going to public service in a budget that is heavily donor funded. So where is the commitment? So we cannot call it SDG this and sign to it if we actually do not intend to. That's why for me right now, I, I think that we need to create a, an intentional program to grow leaders who are committed to walking their talk. Mm -hmm. I think women have a need to realize that when a woman messes up wherever they are, it sort of touches other women. Like after that, everybody's like, oh, we're not getting another woman for this, or we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. Women in power, women who've been in parliament more than 10 years, please, can you grow somebody to take your place? Challenge yourself to rise to another position. If last time you're a woman parliamentarian, you're big enough, you're influential enough, you now have enough social capital to go for the main parliamentary seat, you know? So we can increase our representation in parliament. If you are a, a woman like me, mentor other women so they can take your place. I was very proud that three women ran for president after me. I mean, for me, that was, it was sad that the law society didn't, you know, give us the votes, but that was that that was testimony 
So what what are you doing to preserve your place for the next woman? What are you doing to ensure that the, the resources you've had access to, someone else can access? We have, um, this is now to the banks, you know, the COVID relief fund. There's a COVID relief fund that's supposed to be given to people at 10%. Women-led businesses were some of the biggest hit businesses in COVID. The banks are hiding this money. Where is it? You know, and if you are a woman in charge of a bank, can you please come out and, and, and be the change we want to see, be the sunshine that this country needs. We need people to get up and um, Rebecca Kadaga, Honorable, when she was in parliament, she created this gender certificate that when you bring people for jobs in parliament, they at least 50, a certain percentage of them have to be women. That's a legacy. That's how we should be thinking. If you're a woman out there and you have an education and you have a position and you have, it is your duty to deal with the women problems in the country. They're on your shoulders. They do not wait for the president of the Republic of Uganda or the gender minister to sort these problems out. They're ours to sort. Mm -hmm.